on the news that LeBron James has a significant setback with his high ankle sprain. He is out at least five more days. And there are many, including Woj Bomb, who say that he may be out for the rest of the regular season. This is a big setback. But what we saw the other night was a LeBron James who was very clearly not ready to play. Came back too early. Woj Bomb reported that LeBron was feeling the pressure of Laker losses mounting and came back too soon, felt sharp pain in that lower leg, and now they're calling it a setback. Jake, he's out at least several more days. How much of a big deal, how big of a deal is this for the L.A. Lakers? I mean, yeah, it's always a big deal when LeBron's out. I mean, for any team, whether it was you know in the past or, or current day, I, I think the, the issue for this team is that Anthony Davis has been out for so long that that now that you know the the chemistry is, they're still building that and and yes I do think they have the advantage of playing together last year in the bubble and winning the championship and everything so it's not going to be as difficult for them but at the same time you know you're you're in a position here where you're you know meddling and playing around with the playing tournament you know instead of being a a, a four or, or a five seed you're you're talking about being a six, seven, eight seed, you know, and, and that that's dangerous uh, territory to be in. I think a lot of people before this happened, you know, before this news came out, you know, yesterday and today, a, a lot of people felt like, well, LeBron's going to come back. They're, they're going to, they're going to play, you know, 10 games together and they'll be good to go. Everything will be fine. And I think that that was not wishful thinking, but I think that that was very optimistic. I, I think that people don't understand how difficult it is to come back from a high ankle sprain, especially at, uh, I mean, what is he, 36 or whatever he 80, is now? 84. So, you know, he's not young anymore. And, and so I think that these kind of injuries, um, you know, they can, be a, uh, they can be difficult to come back from. Let's yes. be honest. The guy is not Jesus Christ. I mean, the guy is not, you know, bulletproof. He's not any different than any other human being, man. I mean, it, it's going to be difficult for sure. And I think that LeBron, you know, has has earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to injuries. Absolutely. He's he's yeah. been incredibly durable, but at the same time, you know, this question of hey, is it is are they better off playing with AD and everybody else on the roster instead of trying to force LeBron back? And my opinion is yes. I don't think that a 50% LeBron James is going to do anything good for you on the floor. He's got to be agree. as close to 100 as possible. Well, because when LeBron's out there and he's being LeBron, he has to have the basketball. It is He is the straw that stirs that drink when he's playing. The reason I say the Lakers are better off without LeBron, because he's not nearly himself. And you saw all the turnovers the other night, his inability to dunk the basketball the other night. Uh, you could see he was favoring that leg, and I think it really limited his ability to impact a positive outcome for the Lakers. And this is a team, frankly, that has zero room for error. They're in the play-in tournament right now, and I don't see any way that they're going to get out of it because, again, they have a very difficult schedule. So, yes, as outlandish as it seems, this L.A. Laker team is better off without LeBron James because he's not ready to go. And Anthony Davis is a beast unto himself. And the way that the depth on this Laker team has developed through James and AD's absence, I think they're in a good spot if they can focus their offense around Anthony Davis. And if guys like Cantavius Caldwell Pope can continue to. to yeah, Cantavius. Can, uh -huh. Cantavius. KCP. Cantavius can continue along with the Carusos and the Kuzes and the Morrises. I, you know, Morris has to play well. Harrell has to play well. Drummond, like they have no room for error now. But when you have a guy like Anthony Davis, that really makes a difference. And this is why you gave up the King's ransom you did to get AD onto this roster. I think now that LeBron's out of the picture for at least a week, week and a half, yeah. I think they're much more focused on what their offense looks like. I actually think they're in good shape here. Yeah, I, I think they're they're in good shape too. I, I, I think that this has just been a really difficult, difficult season, not just for the Lakers, but for, for everybody. You know, I mean, we, we talk so often, I mean, on a daily basis, we talk about, you know, the Jazz dealing with their injuries and, you know, the, the, the Suns are missing players. And, and now obviously the, the Lakers are trying to come back from their injuries. But, but I think that, you know, with LeBron's game, the, the way he physically plays the game, he's always been somebody who's played a more physical brand of basketball. Now, that we've seen that fade away as he's gotten older and worked deeper into his career. Excuse me, as his game has evolved, 
Not Whatever. as he's got yeah. Not as he's gotten older, Jake. Mm. As his game has evolved, right? LeBron has worked in a fadeaway jumper. Which I want to thank me for having no days off. Right? I mean, it, LeBron's worked really hard to add that to his arsenal. The problem is, is that LeBron's game, whether he's got the fadeaway or not, is still predicated on him being able to go to the basket and being able to distribute. Yes. And that is a very physical brand of basketball to be playing. I, I think one of the things that um, that that is really a defining factor in, in the difference between Kobe and LeBron and Michael is that Michael and Kobe, their game was all skill and finesse. They, they never were really, later in their careers, they were not about, you know, playing physical basketball and dunking on people. They were yeah. all about, you know, the elbow jumpers, the mid-range and all that. And I think for LeBron, this postseason run, because I do think he's going to come back. Hell or high water, he's coming back. And if that means he's going to suffer an injury, a major injury, I think I think he's resigned to that fact. Honestly, like I think he is. So I don't know about that, dude. I'm, but you you think it's ridiculous? But I'm he rushed himself back. If you weren't willing to risk that, why did you rush yourself well, back? And I think the explanation that Woj bomb gave on ESPN. I'll stop right now. I promise. Adrian Wojnarowski on ESPN said. LeBron never was able to test that ankle, so he didn't know its current state. All he was doing was rehabbing and doing light jogging. Mm. He, the, because you don't practice these days in the NBA. You really don't. You have so many games that you just don't have time for practice anymore. So what you're seeing is you're seeing teams shoot around, and you're seeing teams strength and conditioning. That's it. So that's all LeBron was doing. He got into the game, according to Adrian Wojnarowski, and couldn't cut, couldn't jump, couldn't explode, couldn't dunk, wasn't confident enough to go to the basket. Mm. So you saw a lot of wild passes, a lot of wild turnovers. And finally, what you saw was LeBron James take off his shoes and throw them on the ground in frustration. And then he covered his ankles with a towel because he was getting treatment yeah. on the bench. I mean, I just don't think he ever had the chance to test that ankle. But I also think he's singularly focused on ending his career with Bronny on his team. Mm. I think he wants to play with his son, and I think he will do anything that he can do to make that happen. So I don't think he's willing to suffer a major injury. I really don't. I, I could be wrong. But also, by the way, I look at the eight games they have left. Where is he out in this schedule? Yeah, Because it's at, at the Clippers, which is at home in L.A., um, at Portland on Friday. So Thursday, Friday, back-to-back Clippers and, and Blazers. That Blazer game, I'm telling you, they're going to they're gonna lose that Blazer game in Rip City. Mm. They're going to wind up tied with Portland, which means they'll be in the, in the tournament. Yep. Um, then it's home for Phoenix, home for the Knicks, home for the Rockets. There's the out right there. The Rockets game should no be gimme, a though. win. It's no gimme. But the way the Rockets are playing, it is no gimme. Um, and then your final road trip is at Indiana and at New Orleans. And if you look at the way Lonzo Ball's playing, tell me he's not on a mission to prove some people wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he is. I, I think that he uh, he's a player that um, has developed that jump shot, and yeah, is trying to prove people wrong. Exactly right. But but overall, look with the Lakers. I just think that that LeBron James. You know, to, there's there's a small part of me that says you can't have it both ways, which is, hey, I know my body. I've taken care of my body. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. And then, you know, everyone wants to talk about, well, he wasn't able to test his ankle and he wasn't able to play and that's practice right. and all this stuff. So, like, to me, like, I, I to me, that's just uh, – I'm not saying he's making an excuse, but what I am mm -hmm. saying is that you're LeBron James. You, you're, you're a storied athlete who has always been able to take care of his body – and now you want to roll out and say, well, I wasn't sure if I was ready or not. I had to test it. And it's like, okay, well, if you weren't sure, if you weren't 100% sure that you were ready, you should not have been out there what because now there? Yeah. it's going to cost you another week. And and, and that's just well, kind of frustrating. And you know what? Maybe this is a, a tip of the cap to the Utah Jazz because they're not rushing Conley and Don back. Both are out again tonight against San Antonio on the, yeah. the second game of that back-to-back -back against San Antonio. Um, and obviously – when you are in the position that the Jazz are, where you're not playing consecutive days, um, and you are tied for first in the West with the Suns, and you know the Suns are are playing back-to-back -back nights, where they had a game in Cleveland last night. Overtime didn't really matter. Cam Johnson dominated overtime. Um, you know, Mikhail Bridges dominated overtime. It was never in doubt. Um, now they go to Atlanta tonight after playing Cleveland last night. That's a tough hill to climb for the for the Phoenix Suns. Now they're the best road team in the NBA. Yeah. 
but that's still a tough road to climb. You're playing, if you're the Jazz, you're playing back-to-back with the Spurs, but you've had a night off in between. So those back-to-back games are separated. But this is that game, again, that I always talk about with the Jazz, where it's a must-win game. Right. And that, that what is the right way to say this? That benefit of the doubt that this Jazz team gets when they're 100%, I don't know that that's there anymore. And there were a lot of YouTube comments yesterday. One guy was saying, well, this Jazz team is taking it easy. They're only playing, you know, it's 65% effort. No, my ass. This team's trying everything they can. If you watch Jazz games, and I know Jake and I never watch yeah, Jazz we, games. Yeah, we, we don't, even, uh, we don't yeah. even have a TV. I yeah. mean, you know, we I do mean, watch Chicago PD, but we don't really have a TV. Yeah, we know? watch that on our phone, and yeah. our phone only works for Chicago PD uh-huh. because that's how we roll in this uh-huh. house. Uh-huh. But we don't watch Jazz games. But when I watch Jazz games, the thing that I notice right away <laughs> is that <laughs> there absolutely is want to and desire and effort there. This Jazz team, whether it be Royce O'Neal or, you know, you look at what Boyan Bogdanovich is doing right now, um, they're busting their ass. They're trying to win every game. So this idea, and the commenter on YouTube was talking about how, oh, they're at 65% effort. No, they're not. Yeah, Rudy's Rudy's 24 and 15 is 60% effort, yeah, I'm sure. Well, but the thing is, the th- and a lot of people don't want to talk about this with the Jazz, right now with this group of talent and these guys on the floor, they're 100% looks like 65%. That's how good Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley are and how important they are to this lineup. But having seen what LeBron's going through and some of the other injuries in the conference, maybe the Jazz are smart for super slow playing guys when they know, they don't know that they're going to win, but what they know is they're better than San Antonio without Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley. Yeah. So you're likely to win that game. Why would you rush that back? The game of of consequence is Friday night against Denver. Yeah, I, I, I think that... Yeah, I think you make a great point. I think that for the for the Jazz, the, I agree with you. They're definitely not playing sixty percent. They're they're playing a hundred percent. They're they're yes. you know they're they're doing everything that they can possibly do to to win these games. But at the same time, when we talk about the coaching staff and in the front office and the kind of the mentality right now, I do think that there is this kind of. There's this conversation happening about, okay, we're going to walk this really, really fine line. So, okay, it's the Spurs. We won the first game. We have a yes. night off, and then we're playing them again. Okay, we're not going to rush these two back. Oh, we're playing back-to-back, you know, not that this is the case, but like back-to-back of Phoenix and Portland, and these are two games that we have to have. Okay, then maybe we think about bringing our boys back, you know, sooner than maybe we're comfortable with. But right now, I, I think that as long as you are – and it's so funny how this worked out, but as long as you are tied with the Suns, you still have the opportunity to win the one seed. I think once yes. you're officially a game behind the Suns, then that's when this conversation changes. Yep, I agree. Um, Mikey says, I just don't see what you guys are looking at. It's very clear Quinn Snyder is managing the load of many of these players, and they are not giving their level best. I, like, What makes you say they're not? You're talking about your team. And you're saying that your team is not trying hard. That's ridiculous. I don't see a single jazz player on the floor. And and forget the young guys like Oni and Forrest. You know that they're doing everything they can do to achieve. Yeah. I look at guys like Royce O'Neal the other night, you know, like sprinting through a passing lane and then sprinting down the floor to get the pass to make the dunk. Like he doesn't have to so, do that. Like, if you look at Rudy, yeah. Rudy blocking shots, Rudy, you know, working hard on the glass, jumping up and down in that in that jump ball situation um, the other night with Pirtle, that's not sixty five percent effort. But I think what's happening here is people are misinterpreting what what Quinn is doing. So people, the comment was, "Hey, you know, Quinn is clearly managing minutes." And I, I actually respectfully disagree with that. I don't think the reason the rotation is changing is because he's trying to manage minutes. I think what he's doing is he understands that right now, much like the Lakers, right now, this this the second-tier player on this roster, that group of guys has to come together so that when Mike and Don come back, this group is good, and then we can add Mike Conley and Donovan Mitchell to a solidified quality basketball group. But see, here's the question I have about that. Mm -hmm. Are you really going to play Trent Forrest in the playoffs? No, I mean, you're not. Trent Forrest is not going to get meaningful minutes, but I think right now, you know, this is definitely an opportunity to get him some minutes. I I mean, you know, he's a young guy. You don't want to, you do not want to run Joe Ingles and, and Bogey and, 
and, and all these guys into the ground with minutes, you know? So, yes, on one hand, it's like, oh, well, they're managing minutes. Well, managing minutes is like playing a guy like 15 minutes, like the Suns do with Chris Paul on, on certain nights, you know? That's not what's happening here. What, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, we're looking for some different combinations here. Let's put Forrest out there with a different set of guys this time than we did last time and see how it works out. See what the opportunity is. See what he can read on the floor. You know, And, and that's what I think is happening. And, and I like it, but at the same time, I'd also like it a lot more if you were up you know, three or four games on the one seed. I don't love where they are right now. Yeah, and Ty says... Do you guys just like to argue? Is this this show is turned into jazz fans are always wrong? But I, I uh, about what uh, about uh, what? And though? I just there's more to his comment here. But uh, you're, you're you're talking about you, you. How do I say this intelligently? You you're crazy if you think the Jazz aren't trying to win every game with 100 percent of what they got. I that just that's not who competitors at this level are. And his other his other point is load managing means you're not trying your best to win games. No, that is not what load That's management not what means. That means dude. Load management means that you are giving Joe Ingles, you know, lighter minutes. You you're load managing a guy like look at the way the Suns load manage Chris Paul. How do they do that? They play him in the fourth quarter. They play him in crunch time. But what they do is in the second quarter, instead of giving him a four minute rest, they're giving him an eight minute rest. Because you know that you have other guys. Carter right now for the Suns is playing really good basketball, right? You know that you have guys who can step in there. Cam Johnson plays a huge role last night. When, when um, you know, Devin Booker, load managing Devin Booker in the third quarter when the game is, is when the, the Cavs are making their comeback. So what do you do? You rest Devin Booker six minutes instead of four minutes. And Mikhail Bridges stands in the corner where he's automatic from three, and he keeps you in the lead in that game. Mm -hmm. That's load managing. That doesn't mean you're not trying to win. With the Jazz, it's pretty simple here, right? You've made the decision that you are not going to play Mike Conley until he is at his level best. Absolutely the best that hamstring can be. That's when we'll play Mike Conley. And I agree with that. Right. So what are you doing? You're you're looking at Joe Ingles having to bring the ball up a lot more. What is that? What's the side effect of that? Those are arduous, more difficult, more stressful minutes. So what are you doing? He's sitting long stretches in the second and the fourth quarter. And you can see where there, there we were at the game the other night, even though we don't watch jazz basketball, we were at the jazz game the other night, and we were sitting there saying, where, when is Ingles coming back here Yeah, against Toronto in a game that was actually really close? Yeah. But what he's doing is he is using other figures. He is using – that's why – why do you think that Boyan Bogdanovich is so aggressive to the rack right now? Because stylistically this team has changed and they found success. That doesn't mean they're not trying their best because guys like Derek Favors are getting fewer minutes. Guys like Rudy Gobert are, are playing less minutes, less longer stretches. I would love to understand where this – like. This whole thought came from. I mean, I'm. I, it's I, amazing. I, I'm not, to me. I don't even mean it from a. I'm not trying to criticize people. I'm. I'm just genuinely surprised that people really believe that that the sun or the Suns that, that, that the Jazz are giving sixty percent effort. I, I mean, honestly, like they're That's they're not. Crazy. Like I. I don't know. I, I really. I mean, you're talking about a team that has worked. I mean, think about it. I mean, this team has worked their ass off all year to to get this one seed. You know, pretty much locked up, and now. They're they're pretty much in the fight of their lives to get it. I mean, the, the Suns are level with them. They're right there. I mean, they're, they're yeah. just as good. And I think that, you know, I I guess it, it just seems like sometimes in the comments I feel like we get takes that are just like so out of the blue. And I feel like you got that from somewhere else, someone like a national head or like some kind of like just some take to to have a take. And it's like. There's no way that that these guys are showing up and giving sixty percent. That's just well, not and, what it looks like. And so finally, I get to say this: Hey, man, do you even watch games, Ty? Do you, are, like, are you, you like? Because I don't, I don't see anybody not give it a hundred percent. James Knight, good morning to you from Down Under. Says Utah uh, Jazz should take note. Getting Don and Mike is uh, healthy is way more important than the seeding. I, I, I think they're both equally as important. If the Jazz don't have the number one seed. The they have no road. chance. Yeah, they have no chance to win a championship, in my opinion. If you have to go on the road in a seven-gamer against the Suns and you don't have the altitude and you don't have the Vivint, 
uh, advantage. I, I just don't, I don't know how that works. Uh, Casey Finlinson says, morning, my friends. Uh, Mirzinski, good morning to you. Uh, Sean says, oddly enough, I feel that the Lakers play better without LeBron than with him. Well, yeah, it's kind of crazy to say it, dude. Well, it's, when he's know. hurt right now, I think the Lakers, and that's why, you know what, we started the show talking about this, but that's why when you look at the Lakers right now, I think the Lakers, with the way LeBron is, the Lakers are better without him. And I know that's crazy. He is still arguably the best player in the world, but he's playing on what is what basically acts as a broken leg. A high ankle sprain is a broken leg. You have those two bones at the bottom of your leg that come together, and a, a high ankle sprain means those bones spread apart. It stretches the ligaments, and they stretch to the point where they nearly break. A lot of high ankle sprains involve a, a, a small fracture, a hairline fracture. He does not have that, but that's to the point that those bones stretch apart that's what LeBron's dealing with. So when you hear that he came back too soon and he has severe pain in that ankle, dude, you, you're better yeah. without him. Yeah. Because the other truth here about the Lakers, just the same with the Utah Jazz, if you don't have a fully ready-to-go LeBron James that can jump, explode, he needs the three ball, frankly. He needs to be able to shoot the three to, to play his game. If you don't have that guy, you're not going to win a championship. And as unlikely as it is that the, the Lakers will have to go the long route home, yeah. which is through the play-in tournament, it's highly unlikely you'd win a championship doing that. Without LeBron, I just don't see that there is an opportunity to do that. Because Denver, the Clippers, the Suns, the Jazz, like all those teams are elite. And you, you're looking at a team, what's a comparison to the Lakers, right? Like the Nets last night. Like, the Nets just stopped making shots against the Bucs in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. But you know that James Harden's coming back. That's a guy they're not rushing back. Because the Brooklyn Nets know they don't need to be the number one seed to win a championship. That is a team that is, as, as uh, I think, is the most talented team in the NBA. Yeah. And I, I, I think they know they don't need that to win. By the way, again, I'll just ask, why did, why did the Jazz not try to sign Mike James? Because uh, I think he's giving Brooklyn incredible contributions. Yeah, um, that team's lethal. The Lakers don't have that that margin for error. They don't have that luxury, if you will. LeBron is a really important part of that team if they're going to win a championship. Yeah, I, I think that no, the Nets are the only team that can operate the way they do. I don't think there's another team in the league that has that much talent. And I think again to bring this back home, you know, I think for the Jazz, you know, yeah, we can always go down the rabbit hole of like you know, hey, they didn't draft well enough or, hey, they didn't do anything at the deadline. Everybody knows Everybody knows what that looks like, you know? And so I think at this point, you know, you just have to deal in realities, which is you have you have a, a, a solid roster. It just is, it, it, it lacks some some key things that you'd really like to have. And, and so I think right it now, does. right now, I think it is for Conley, yeah, it needs to be you're not coming back to your 100%. And then for Don, I, I think that they're, you know, he gets the benefit of the doubt uh, because he is uh, one of the best players in the league. So if he says to you, hey, uh, I'm good to go, let's go ahead and give this thing a shot, then I think you got to let him play, you know, but but you just have to be mindful of that because the last thing you want to do here is is have him come back too early because he's eager and he wants to play, and then another setback happens, just yes. like it happened with LeBron. Um, Nick Yarmio, uh, says the jazz are using load management coaching strategy by design. Trust me. The coaches show asked it. No way you tie a tie is better, uh, for Utah than Phoenix. And when it comes to the playoffs where you have a hundred percent effort, you're going to see that, that Phoenix is a good team, but they're not as good as Utah. Man, I, I just I, respectfully disagree. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying that that's a dumb take. I'm not saying that no, that that's like way off base. I just respectfully disagree. I, I think what did we see in the first matchup? Not not this last one, but the first one where both teams were 100 percent healthy. The Suns edged out the Jazz, and, and that that game in particular was yep. very much a postseason style game, half court basketball. You know, possession by possession, that kind of a game. And I, and I just think that the Suns. I, you know, God bless their souls. Nobody watches Suns basketball, and and I really don't understand it. Like nobody, even on the national game. Like we like we've done shows the day after the Suns have been on ESPN, where yes. everybody and their mom can watch the game, and we still have people saying, "Oh, well, they're not as good as the Jazz." And I'm just saying, dude. Like I don't know what 
what product you're you're looking at. Like I don't know what you yeah. see that that makes you feel like the Suns aren't as good. Yeah, Mario Sindrick uh, on YouTube says, I like when these so-called sports experts run their mouths about something that people already knew. Bogdanovich did all these things while he was with the Pacers. He led the, them to the playoffs in 2018 um, with Depot Hurt. Um, and he goes on to say, uh, Bogdanovich is a leader and a captain of his national team, something that Americans don't give an F about. Okay, well... We don't give an F yeah. about the national team because it's a completely different style of game. The international European game is completely different. Nobody's saying that Boyan Bogdanovich is a bad leader. What I'm saying about Boyan is the same thing that I'll, I said yesterday and a month before and the month previous. This has never been who Boyan Bogdanovich is with the Jazz. He's never been attack the basket, play with your back to the basket. He's been one thing. He has been a three-point shooter on this club. By the and way, he, wasn't Indiana four years ago or whatever, like five years ago? Yeah, several years career? ago. I, I, I don't remember the year that he left, and I'll look it up real quick. But this is not who he's been um, with the Utah Jazz. Look, I, 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 think, I think there are a lot of – clearly the Boyan Bogdanovich supporters came out of the uh, woodwork yesterday on YouTube, um, and I appreciate that. There, We got a lot of um, – how do I say? We got a lot of European vitriol yesterday, Jay. Belgian. Yeah. It, well, don't start that, please. Uh, we because uh, that will only bring more European hate. Um, but we got a lot of uh, Euro vitriol. Um, he left the Pacers after the 2019 season. So this is his what is his second season um, with the Jazz? But mm -hmm. he was in Washington. Um, he was with the Nets before that. Um, you know, there was even a, a, a Fenerbahce fan, um, who was, who was talking about his play there. Like, listen, he's never been a guy for the jazz who, who played with his back to the basket or attack the rim. And that's not a criticism of no. him. They didn't ask him to do that. It's he didn't an evolution need to do that. of his yeah, game. Like I, he didn't need to do that because they had all their guys playing. So again, we talked about this on Monday. What happens to Boy uh, to to Boyan's game when when Don and Mike come back? Yeah. What does that look like? He gets the ball a hell of a lot less. That's what it looks but like. But my thing is, is are the Jazz going to make an effort to get him in the block, get him in the post, get him those no, high percentage so. looks early in the game? Because what's going to happen? You can't have three guys playing in the paint, and uh, you already have Rudy. You're going to have, at that point, you would have Boyan as well and Donovan Mitchell because Donovan's game is predicated on attacking the basket. And I, I think that if Boyan is there, I think they will probably have sets for him. I think they will have opportunities for him to do that. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to be, all right, let's, uh, let's just start this set with Boyan on the block. Like, that just doesn't make any sense to how their game flows. So it is what it is. Uh, Sakshay... Shatra Verdi, who you're, oh. you're Sack Shea Jazz. It just is what it is. Anthony Davis never won anything by himself. He had a decent support in New Orleans, but couldn't even crack the playoffs consistency. He is why the Lakers won a championship last year. Um, him and Cantavius. Again, this is this is James. a listen, this is a this is once again one of those conversations that is a deeper basketball conversation. That makes you look silly if you say that Anthony Davis had nothing to do with the Lakers championship or he didn't do anything in no, in you know in New, New Orleans. Orleans. Like, That's what Sack like, is saying. Like if let me ask you this: if he did nothing in New Orleans, why is it that that the Lakers gave up their entire family and the farm to get him? I, I mean that, that it's just that simple, dude. Like you don't like he what he is right now still one of the most dominant players in the NBA I, I mean I, I can't I just can't believe that you would say that he did nothing in New Orleans like you're talking about the Pelicans like come on dude like they had nothing but him that's it so I don't know I just I, that's one of those where I'm like dude like what are you what are you talking about man like yeah. that just seems out on the reservation I, I disagree with this respect ref, respectfully hello uh, disagree. Giggity says, "Morning, fellas. Five hundred subs today. Let's let's hope so. Make yeah. sure you hit subscribe right now on the YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up. Uh, we are giving away this right here. If you're watching on YouTube, we're giving away this uh, Xbox Series S. As soon as we get to five hundred subscribers, we're going to pull a name uh, on the very next program, and we will give away. Yes, we ship internationally. All you have to do is take a picture of your YouTube channel that shows you're subscribed." 
Ta- put that picture on Twitter and tag us, The Monty Show, M O N T Y, The Monty Show, and SLC Supercars. Uh, when you do that, you can do that, by the way, on Twitter, Instagram. When you do that, you're entered to win the Xbox. Boom, done. It's that simple. Pretty easy. Yeah. And when we get to 500 subs, hopefully today, uh, we will we will absolutely uh, give that one away. Um, Eric um, Eric and Raleigh says the Warriors ruined a lot of teams' ability to achieve in the playoffs. Well, the Warriors introduced a three point shot for sure. Um, Giggity says, uh, "Did you see the reverse dunk by Cam last night? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my good. Cam Johnson's turning into a guy. Like he is gonna he is going to get more consistent with his three." But now he's he's attacking the basket because the ball's not going in the hoop from three. Yeah. I mean, that that reverse last night. Mikhail Bridges, I mean, I mean, if you missed the game last night in Cleveland with the Suns, Mikhail Bridges absolutely dominated at the end of the fourth quarter in overtime. Closer, bro. I mean, it was un- unbelievable. Um, you know, uh, let's see. Sean says, I don't like LeBron either, but you've got to give him credit for all he's done, not just this year, but his whole career. Yeah, I mean, he's one of the greatest players ever. Uh, Eric and Raleigh says, um, he's a top five player in the history of the league. I just can't wait until he retires. I think there's a lot of people like that. Uh, Gabe Ledley says morning from Tucson fellas. He had to come see GCU baseball. Mm. Take that two and 13 L from you, Arizona. Now Whoa. I'm driving back to Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> see what he did there? That's a Sean Miller, sweaty Sean reference. Good morning to you, Gabe Ledley. Um, Casey Finlinson says, are the Suns built for a championship? Uh, I'm built wait- for a championship? Mm. I'm waiting for Chris Paul to get hurt. Is that a terrible thing to it's say? It's not I mean, a terrible thing to say. It's true. It's if true. If he stays healthy, they are. Nobody wants to talk about that, whether it's Conley, Chris Paul, yeah. any of these dudes. But, uh, you know, it's you can't, you, you know, we can't. We can't talk about Mike and then not talk about Chris. I mean, that that that's definitely the case. Yeah, and it, it, what's interesting is I think culturally things are very different. What do you I, mean? I, I, mean, I think for the Suns, culturally things are very, very different. They're not the same old Suns uh, that missed the playoffs for a decade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I just think it is... You know, I just I, I think it's interesting that you can change that with one player. Well, yeah, because I mean, it, it, it's it, but they didn't just change it with one player though. That so that's like that's a very sur- again that's surface level. Like like they didn't it's they they didn't just bring you know a bunch of G League players in and Chris Paul you know all of a sudden has carried them to the promised land. I mean, you're you're talking about building this starting five through the draft. You drafted Book, you yeah. drafted Mikael Bridges, you drafted, you know, DeAndre Ayton, you drafted Cam Johnson. Again, this team was built through the draft. And then they added Chris Paul to a mostly drafted team, which is which is, you know, the way you should go about it. That's what that's what most great that's basically how you build a dynasty. Honestly, you have to you have to draft you have to hit it uh, you have to hit home runs in the draft and then you add to that with what you weren't able to get. <laughs> Mr. Mitch, maybe we just have lost our vibe. I don't know. Mr. Mitch says, you're complimenting the Suns' new culture, but you won't say nice things about the attitude in Utah. It's amazing how biased you are against the Jazz. What are you talking about, guys? Okay, the problem is, show me, don't tell me. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, seriously, I don't don't mean to cut you off, but, but hold on. We just sat here and defended the Jazz from all these comments this morning about how, oh, well, they're giving 60% and, and they don't care. And we're sitting here talking about how, hey, they're giving 100%, they're working really hard. And then you want to comment and say that, oh, well, you guys are biased, uh, you know, uh, against the Jazz towards the sun. I think, what, I think what he's saying is the trade deadline. Uh, that's what I'm guessing um, because I don't think that, that the Jazz – I don't think the Jazz – did everything they could do at the deadline to be an NBA champion in in June and July. I don't think they did. I don't think they did anything in the buyout market to make sure that if they had a major injury, I don't know, like Donovan Mitchell, that they had a Bradley Beal or a number two or a Mike James, the best player in Europe who was available, and they didn't even offer on him. They The Utah Jazz did not do everything they could do to bolster this roster. So instead, now we're getting, you know, absolute fluffer service out of Trent Forrest. And I you know, like this was also asked. 
Read the media around the Utah Jazz. Read the beat writers around the Jazz. There is so much beeging of Trent Forrest excuse right me, now. Excuse me. The proper nomenclature is slurping. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank there you. is so much slurping of Trent Forrest. And oh, <laughs> Trent Forrest is not going to get major minutes in the playoffs. I'm telling Oni, like, they're going to play seven, eight guys in the playoffs. My guess is George Niang is going to see a limited role in the playoffs. I think off the bench, you're going to see Favors and Clarkson. And then situationally, if a guy fits. I don't think you're going to see 20 minutes out of George Niang. I just don't. I don't think that's who Quinn Snyder is. And we can sit here and we can, you know, sugarcoat things and, you know, slurp the jazz all day if you want. But on this show, we keep it real. And I'm telling you right now, the Utah Jazz did not do everything they could do to ensure that A, they won the number one seed, and B, they won an NBA championship. And by the way, when have they ever been in a better position to win an NBA championship than they are right now? There's no Michael Jordan standing in their way in the East. Because every team out East has a fatal flaw, and this Jazz team is good enough to beat any team in the East, especially defensively. So don't tell me that, like, oh, well, you're biased, Mr. Mitch. I'm not being biased. What I'm telling you is there has to be an attitude change. You have a new owner. You have all kinds of energy and money that's being pumped into this team. Go buy some talent. Oh, they, nobody will come here. Okay, go trade for some talent. Mike James wouldn't come here? I mean, it's amazing to me that here we are, and we still are trying to explain why the Utah Jazz didn't make a move at the deadline and why they didn't make a move in the buyout market. Yeah. I'm amazed by that. Yeah. That's that's incredible to me. Yeah. Uh, Casey Finlinson says the Jazz need Ryan Smith and D. Wade to change the, quote, happy to be here culture around, yeah, it, I completely around the agree. organization. But by the way, exactly what's, what's, right. I mean, I know Dwayne Wade's been here for five minutes, but but this was a guy who was supposed to come in and like give this team a bunch of advice and like really upgrade everything and 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 that you know hasn't quite happened yet in my opinion. So I, I love guys like I love guys like Mitch and, and Ty and all these guys that want to come in here and, and criticize us. But at the at the same time, I'm just going to keep saying it to you guys straight in your face. What have we been wrong about? Find me find me what we've been wrong yep. about on this team. What exactly have we said on this show over the last ninety days, hundred days? That we've been wrong about. We told you they were going to lose by 20 to the Suns. We told you they should have done more at the trade deadline. We told you that Aaron Gordon was going to be uh, a really legit, great addition for the Nuggets. We told you it, months ago that Nikola Jokic was going to be in the MVP conversation. We told you that the Suns were a problem. You didn't want to listen to us. And now where are we? We're right here. We're sitting right here. We've nailed every single thing on this team, and you want to come in here in the comments and tell us that we don't know what we're talking about. Maybe you should go back and listen, and maybe you should take a realistic look at this team instead of coming in here with frustration and telling us we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, Mr. Rich back in, he says, um, I, you guys are right 99% of the time, but it just feels like you being right is haterade. I think you meant haterade. But it's, uh, okay. How, let me ask you it this. Is, it let is me what ask it you is. This. It, 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 you're not the Utah Jazz. Again, how do I? How I don't know how to say this any more succinctly than sit here and make me the case that the Jazz did everything they could do to win a championship right now today this year. How is it? How is it that right being right and having haterade don't go together? They they are not together, right? Yeah. Being right about something means that you did your homework. You were factual, you were logical in the take that you have, which is what we bring you guys every single day, and we work hard to make sure that we don't just throw outlandish crap out there on this show, right? Haterade would be saying, well, Donovan Mitchell isn't a superstar, and, and he's never going to take this team anywhere, and he's hurt, so this team sucks. That, that would be hating, yeah. but we don't, we don't bring you that, and that's, do and, that, and that's why I say, like, like, forgive me for being frustrated with the comments, but, but at some point... You guys have to come around to the idea that just because you don't like what we have to say doesn't mean that we're hating on the Jazz. Yeah. We're giving you yeah. a realistic view. I mean, what would you rather have? Would you rather have all the beat writers and all the people in this town that cover the Jazz telling you that Trent Forrest is some amazing player who who you know was a great draft pick and who's going to be the second coming of Donovan Mitchell, which just is not true? Or would you rather listen to something that is like, hey, this is where the Jazz are at. They're a really good team. They've got some injuries, and they didn't do what they needed well, to do. And you hit me with a, a tweet yesterday talking about how um, one of the guys at the zone here in Salt Lake City was tweeting about how the Jazz have drafted so well, and Dennis Lindsay finding Trent Forrest and Oni, and 
And it's like, yeah, that's cool that you won in the second round. The problem is you win and lose the draft in the first round. Um, but yeah. that's the kind of spin you get from the flagship. Yeah. That's the kind of – and I love Ben Anderson. I still believe he's the best NBA guy in this town. Um, but Ben's – I think Ben Anderson's in a position where he's not going to be critical of the Jazz. He just he just won't. Um, I think if, if you want the unvarnished truth in the media here, you you go to Tony Jones. I agree with that. I yeah. think Tony is as straight shooter as you get. But my point is we don't have a bias on this show because we're not beholden to anybody. We're beholden to us and you. By the way. That's it. By the way, it should be said, we make zero money on this show. No, We don't make a dollar on this show. We're, we get up at 4.45 every day to deliver a product that's honest and truthful about our local teams. Yeah. And, and that, and that I, I think, should really speak you know, volumes and show you guys that it, it's not that we're just trying to hate on the Jazz. Like, we're not going to sit here and say that this team has done a great job in the draft or, like, that this team is somewhere where they're not. Yes, they're a great team. I feel like... I feel like you guys always point out when we when we criticize them, but you don't want to point out when we're sitting here defending them about, you know, we got all these comments today about, oh, well, they're giving 60% effort. And it's like, no, they're not. They're giving 100% effort. They just find themselves in a, in a, in a little bit of a situation right now. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I say, like, if you're going to come in here and criticize us, just understand that we're, we're not here to hate on the Jazz. We're here to give you the, the honest-to-God truth about where this team's at. Yeah, um, let's see. Seek uh, YT says, guys, almost over 500 followers. You, uh, Sean says you should be able to get get it during the show today. Two yeah. away. Oh, we're two away from 500 oh, that's, now. Are hey. we really at hey, hey. I, I don't the track time is it coming. That, I don't track it that closely during the hour at 498. Wow, how about that? Let's go. How about that? Let's go. Again, subscribe to the show right now. If you're watching, please give us a thumbs up. It really helps the channel grow. Um, hit subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, please hit subscribe. Take a photo that you're subscribed. Put that photo on Twitter or Instagram and tag The Monty Show, M-O-N-T-Y, The Monty Show, or SLC Supercars. You do that, you're entered to win. The 500th subscriber will be entered to win yeah. the, this Xbox Series 501 S. won't. 501, 501 will won't. not. 500 so will. 500 will. Um, and what I what I'm saying is, as soon as as soon as we cross 500, like if we do it during the show, we'll give it away f- tomorrow on the show. Absolutely, because we need to do it fairly. We need to make sure we have all the entries. We're you know we're putting them into a pod. We're gonna draw a name right here on the show. Um, and then we'll, yes, we will ship internationally too. Yes. I get that question every day. <laughs> um, James Knight says, "Is that right, Jake? So Brooklyn built their roster through the draft." I didn't say that Brooklyn built their roster through the draft. Where did That's not that what come I from? I didn't say that. I said the Warriors built their built their built their team through the draft. The Suns built their team through the draft. Yes. Right? Like and then and then I'm sure James is gonna come in here and say, Well, they added KD. Okay, yeah, that was after they, they went to the finals twice or whatever it was, and Steph was a two time champion. The Warriors champion, dude. are built on Steph, Clay, and Draymond. Yeah. All of uh, those are all their assets that they drafted. Um uh, there are teams, there are super teams that win championships. I think the Suns um, you know, the Lakers with Shaq, I would say was, you know, that was money spent that won them championships. Pau Gasol, like, okay, dude, cool. Let's, but, but dude, let's, if we're going to talk about super teams, I, I'm LeBron is still getting hated on for being the creator of super teams. Cause that's where the super team thing started. No, nah, I think it's the Celtics who started the super team. Well, okay. Ray Allen, KG, but I would agree with you that this, Hey, we're going to put a team together that, yeah, and I, go I mean, in. That's LeBron for sure. No doubt. You're talking about guys who are putting teams together five years before the team actually can be together. Yeah. I mean, this Brooklyn team has been in the works for a legit five years. years. I mean, Katie and Kyrie have been talking about it for years, And then for James years, Harden dude. just happened. See, yeah. but this is the thing. This is why I don't vilify Brooklyn for this. If you could do it, you would do it too. 100%. If, if James Harden became available and you didn't call the Houston Rockets, you're not trying to win a championship. Like the Utah and, Jazz. And, and, well, I was just going to say, does anybody think the Jazz called the Rockets about James Harden? My guess is they did not. And I think you're a fool if you if he's available and you don't make that call. I, I, I just do. Um, Jake, why do you – Ian says, Jake, why do you think Mike James would have had a significant impact on the Jazz? Because I think Mike James is Jordan Clarkson 2.0. I think he's more consistent. I think he is a better distributor. An and elite I think, handle. I think Mike James plays the game – uh, plays the mental side of basketball at a higher level than Jordan Clarkson does. Meaning, meaning that 
like uh, when we were at the game Saturday and in other games that we've watched, a lot of times Jordan Clarkson goes into, oh, I have the ball. I need to score. I have, like, it's my job in life to Black score hole. this basketball rather than saying, hey, okay, what's the situation in front of me? Do, do I, am I in a situation where I've got a good matchup that I can play one on one with and go score? Okay, great. Or does the situation dictate that I should play pick and roll with Rudy or whatever the case may be? And that's why I think, you know, if you go and watch, I would encourage you guys, go and watch what Mike James recently has done in Europe and then go and watch what he's doing for Brooklyn. You will see the, the, the it's very similar. The situations that he's able to create are very similar and he makes the right decision. Well, and I, I think the other thing that stands out to you, if if you, Ian, if you look at what Mike James does, it's exactly what the Jazz are missing. Joe Ingles being on the ball is not good for, for Joe Ingles or the Jazz. Mm -hmm. Joe Ingles is a much better player away from the ball when he's not having to be point jingles, uh, as I like to call him. Mike James is an elite distributor. His court vision, his passing, his ability to finish amongst the trees in the paint, um, I mean, if you just look at his Nets highlights, if yeah. you look at his shot-making ability while he was in Italy, oh, my goodness. And I do think you make I a mean, good point about, uh, you know, also we notice that Jordan Clarkson does not play a lot of point guard for this team. He, like, does he not plays a lot play of two guard. guard. He plays a lot of scoring guard. And I think that that, that, is, that is something else that Mike does do for the Nets quite a bit. And I will just ask you, yeah, who would Mike James be playing instead of on this roster right now? Trent Forrest. Yeah. And if you look at Forrest, his three-point shooting is 20%. Mike James is an elite three-point shooter. Um, his screen and roll game lacks. Mike James is an elite pick and roll, screen and roll player. Yeah. Mike James would make a significant impact on this team. Uh, James Knight said, let's be real. Good teams only run eight or nine deep for the most part in the playoffs. Yeah. I agree. We if were Harden, just saying that. If Harden came to Utah, they would be one, have one less Jazz fan. I hate that guy. If James Harden came to Utah, you'd be odds-on favorites to win a championship this year. Yeah. And he and Donovan Mitchell would be unbelievable. A by the way, combo. by the way, just want to make sure we're clarifying. We're not sitting here saying that we actually like James Harden as a guy or like, yeah. you know, that James Harden is our favorite player. I but, want him on my team. But like everybody can agree, dude can score the basketball. Dude would take you to the finals. Dude would make this team way better. So let's not sit here and like, you know, say, well, we wouldn't want James Harden on the team. Like, yeah, you would, but he, you know, we don't like him. I think, you know, I, I agree with that comment. Yeah. Um, Rex says, anybody who listens to this show knows that Monty and Jake keep it straight. Monty, I appreciate you from way back in the K fan days. Well, oh, I my God. That. Thank you. Let's go. Uh, Casey Finlinson said, if people think this show is biased towards anything outside of Nike, then they haven't listened ever. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> by the way, by the way, brand new Jordan. On hey. the today. Brand new Jordan, the red 13 is on the oh! line. Eight spots left. Oh, by the way, seven because I want to. I want to draw yesterday. So wait, what's going to happen when when the shoe wall gets filled up, bro? I mean, what what do we you know? Well, we're going to build another shoe wall. Emma, what do you do? <laughs> it is what it is. It's my passion. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, James Knight says Harden is a culture killer. Yeah, I think that there's definitely a conversation around that. I, I definitely mm. think. I, I I think that. So here's the thing. It, it, it kind of, this conversation has evolved. So before the production in Brooklyn happened, before his, you know, the James Harden effect happened in Brooklyn and everything went down with the Rockets, yeah, I think you could have made a really strong case that James Harden was a selfish player and a player that, that blows up locker rooms, you know, but then, but then, you know, he goes to Brooklyn and everything seems to be fine. And, and I don't quite know how to explain that other than to just say that there was a, you know, either a philosophical difference between Harden and the Rockets front office or whatever, like Harden just had an issue. And I, and I think that, you know, what we're seeing with the Aaron Rodgers situation, what we saw with the James Harden situation in Houston, what we're seeing across the league when guys want to move, I think you, you're seeing that they are going to be selfish and they're going to have a me first mentality. And I think that part of that conversation is he's earned that right, right? Like with what he's done in the league, he's earned the right to be selfish. But I also agree with this Jazz team and the culture this team has, this is a very team-first organization. I think we can all agree on yes. that. So, in reality, you know, the fit of James Harden would be interesting, to say the least. And and by the way, this team is not one to just go out hand in, handing out long-term contracts, you know? Rudy's contract was the first one in, in a bit that was like, wow, this is like a big boy long-term deal right here. And yeah. that's what James Harden was looking for. 
Um, Mikey asks an interesting question. Um, are you saying that the Suns need home court advantage less because they're better on the road? Uh, I'm saying that's absolutely the truth. I think if you look at these two teams, the Jazz and the Suns, everybody wants home court advantage. Of course. There's no doubt about that. But if you're – and I just asked this question on Twitter, so I'm interested to see who comes back. The Phoenix Suns are the best road team in the NBA. 25-9 and, and nine right now, I think, I mean, on the road? They, they, are, they are able to execute – at a very high level away from um, No Name Arena, Phoenix Suns Arena, uh, <laughs> which is weird to me. Phoenix Suns Arena. They're able to, to execute on the road, and it's because Chris Paul. Um, it's because of the maturation of Devin Booker. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And the other thing is, it's not that the Jazz are bad on the road, because they're not. But this team's home court advantage is so overwhelming. It's real, bro. Even when, again, we don't watch games, but when we were at the game the other night... Um, even a, a quarter-filled building is loud and raucous and difference-making. The booing that happened with some of those calls was crazy. Yes. Dude. It was loud. It was loud at the Vivint the other night. And yeah. I think that you're seeing that the, the Jazz have what I maintain. Salt Lake City's a really good home court advantage. I'm telling you, like Rice Eccles Stadium it is undervalued. It's I think when it's when it's full and the Utes are good, the the – the Utah Utes football team has the best home field advantage in football, and I, people undervalue that. I think Salt Lake City sports fans, just in general, whether it is the Utes or, or BYU or the Jazz or whatever, like I think Salt Lake City sports fans are definitely one of the most underrated fan bases in terms of like passion and and how much they watch. Um, you know, we always hear about oh well, you know, uh, the Brooklyn fans and Philly and New York and all these East Coast you know hard asses are are great fans. But honest to goodness, like, what does it say about a half full arena that they can absolutely light it up, you know, with the booing and like affecting the game? And like, I, I think it's crazy. It's awesome. It's it, it it is. It's interesting to me. I, I it is what it is. Uh, Austin Lewis says, "Did you guys get my tweet? My handle is Austin seventy one eighty one ten ten. Um, yeah, I can look. Uh, Gabe Ledley says Utah Karens being uh, be getting loud. Yes, they do. <laughs> Utah Karens. I, I would agree with that. I I just think you have the difference between home court advantage in Phoenix and Utah is in Phoenix you have a lot of transient fans. Um, frankly, like when the Lakers come to Phoenix, it's a Laker crowd. Yeah. Um, just because you have so many transplants in the Valley, it's very difficult. Um, you know, and I think when the Suns are playing the Washington Wizards, it's mm. a Suns crowd. Yeah. When the Suns play the Chicago Bulls, when the Coyotes play the Chicago Blackhawks, when the D-backs play the Cubs, um, when the Mets, the Yankees, when anybody comes into Phoenix from a major metro area, Florida, New York, Chicago, I mean, like, it's yeah. Cleveland yeah, with the Cleveland Browns fans. Like, there's so many people that relocate to Arizona because of finances, taxes, home values. It's a great place to live. Except it's really hot. Uh, but all those fans are in Phoenix, and so the home court advantage is less. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you the Mormon population and in, in the Utah alumni are massive in Arizona. Um, so you have a lot of Utah Jazz fans there. Yeah. Um, and having been the Jazz Suns games, it's a lot of loud Jazz fans when, when the Jazz are in Phoenix. Anyway, my point is, listen, I think the Jazz need home court advantage more because it's so, so overwhelming.